Jujutsu Kaisen is filled to the brim with a lot of formidable threats, and be it current or ancient sorcerers, many have become fan favorites. Amongst these characters, two in particular stand out, Culling Game's strongest player Hajime Kashimo and Jujutsu Society's mysterious special grade sorcerer Yuki Tsukumo. In possessing such titles, one can't help but wonder how they would influence the story, their full power, and how far they would go when all is said and done. Unfortunately for both Kashimo and Yuki, by the end of their stories, they would feel left behind by the narrative. Almost like they were wasted. Making her official entrance into the story in Chapter 76, Yuki is labeled as a no-good special grade who just bums around overseas and doesn't take on missions. An interesting way to introduce one of the story's top tiers during this time as we understand that special grades tend to be busy doing actual Jujutsu sorcery work until her motivation is understood in her efforts to rid the world of cursed spirits. Communicating her bigger picture approach to her job in contrast to patching up the wounds left behind by said cursed spirits. Her three propositions to achieve her goal educate us on her character and how it is to be perceived. Not as someone who is just lazy for laziness sake, but rather as someone who's actively trying to make a better world. At the same time, she does not oppose entertaining more radical ideas like killing all non-sorcerers. This does two things. One, it inspires Ghetto's eventual outlook on the world, and two, shows Yuki is willing to see morbid ideas for their efficacy. Granted, killing all non-sorcerers has some serious moral implications if taken flight, but teaching everyone to control cursed energy isn't exactly a far better alternative. Possibilities of multiple people with high aptitude for jujitsu like Higuruma would cause all sorts of problems for the world. Yuki more than likely understands this to be a possibility and has to choose the lesser of two evils. Not to mention herself, Gojo, Ghetto, and other high-grade sorcerers could perform crowd control so not too many new sorcerers would run rampant. Yuki's next appearance is in Shibuya where she has a bit of a debate against Kenjaku about how to use cursed energy. Her reaffirmed desire to break away from cursed energy came about due to bigger nations more than likely using the Japanese populace as a power source. Naturally, this would result in a slaughter she is completely against, defining her character to be one we can sympathize with, all the while placing her as Kenjaku's ideological opposition. A development that comfortably brings us to chapters 202 through 208. Yuki vs Kenjaku is the fall of her character, figuratively and literally. She and Kenny were never equal to intelligence, strength, or otherwise. Kenjaku's knowledge and understanding of his goal had always been superior to Yuki's own. He's experienced multiple lifetimes with one singular desire in mind, to force humanity's evolution by creating a chaos even he could not control. Take this and compare it to Yuki who remained indecisive in her own pursuits of a single goal. Kenny braved the road no matter what appeared before him. He failed for years, waiting for the stars to align in his favor. Yuki lacks this drive to accomplish her goal of ridding the world of cursed energy, embodying her title as a lazy special grade in that regard. She needed to match Kenjaku's drive for her to force humanity's departure from cursed energy. Their fight, as one would guess, displays this perfectly as Kenjaku has an answer to everything Yuki pulls out against him. I like to think of this as a live debate of their respective outlooks. Kenjaku being the far more experienced with his topic and approach beats down Yuki with his initial arguments, but Yuki manages to make some meaningful counters that strip his argument's foundation until he slips out of it because of his greater knowledge and understanding. I know it may seem like a strange way to express a fight, but all fights are basically physical arguments if you really think about it. Another point of discussion is Choso. Yuki treats him with due respect, helping him come to the solution of his own personal crises, whereas Kenjaku tries to sink him deeper into his misery. Yuki liberates his soul, versus Kenjaku's restricting of it, furthering Yuki's opposition to him as a character. Although I've sung Yuki's praises, her downfall that I mentioned comes packaged with her importance. She is portrayed to be quite a knowledgeable person who could have reached Kenjaku's level given time and dedication. However, he had the necessary ability to continue his dream beyond his original body. Yuki didn't, begging the question of why she didn't try to pass on her goal to Toto or anyone else for that matter. She flirted with the idea of heavenly restriction, but of her own admission states cases of it are too few and far between to be a reliable avenue to pursue. This leaves only one way for her to see her goal realized, that being a solution she could find within her lifetime capable of affecting everyone on a global scale. Not only this, but something everyone would agree to, and with the complexity of Jujutsu Kaisen's world and characters, I don't think it would be the easiest solution to come across. Instead of developing a path to making her ideal world, her journey is cut short to amplify by Kenjaku's own ideals. Yuki feels genuinely unfinished. We get her backstory, her plan of attack, fight, and death all within six chapters. For comparison, Yuta got an entire volume dedicated to him in a battle royale that lasted six chapters. Ghetto also had similar spotlight in a backstory arc, 
and I don't think I have to speak on Gojo's screen time. Every single special grade sorcerer is treated as an essential piece of the story, whilst Yuki is just a gatekeeper who couldn't win so the story could continue. Speaking of her fight with Kenjaku, I'm just going to say it. I wish Choso died instead of Yuki. Choso's character arc had reached his natural conclusion, so dying in an effort to kill his father would have been perfect for him. Another thing to consider is that Yuki's trump card would have probably been very effective against Sukuna, considering it's quite literally a black hole. While I don't think she would have killed him, she could have done a lot of damage before her death. It stated that her will combined with Tengen's barriers stop the attack from destroying the world. So have her damage him, but restrain it enough so she doesn't swallow Sukuna or the planet, and boom, problem solved. All in all, I think her service to the narrative is what saw more care than her actual involvement in the story. And it left me wondering why she received the treatment that she did. Hajime Kashimo was one of the numerous reasons Sukuna persisted in Jujutsu Kaisen. Fighting Hikari in Chapter 185, he's an eccentric battle freak who seemingly loves to push his limits. His precise manipulation of cursed energy makes him a shining example when speaking on the topic, aside from Gojo. Pair this with his near insatiable lust for battle, and he becomes the perfect opponent for Hikari who seemingly resonates with anyone who has fever. Despite Kashimo's clear expertise in cursed energy manipulation, what drew everyone to his character is his curse technique, which he only wanted to use against Sukuna. This brought a tidal wave of speculation regarding his curse technique. From Kiden to Godspeed, any popular lightning ability in anime and manga, Kashimo was fair game to have. However, what mattered most was if he could match up to Sukuna using it. Narrative arguments for and against CT Kashimo floated and bounced around the community at mass. A main detractor were his feats against Akari, meaning his curse technique must amplify his power so greatly it would place him in the top tiers of the verse. Now, after 47 chapters, or in our time, 1 year, 2 months, and 14 days later, we got Kashimo's full power. Only for all this hype to be deflated in 2 chapters because Sukuna vs Gojo happened. Gojo vs Sukuna was far more anticipated than Kashimo vs Sukuna. Spanning 12 chapters filled to the brim with cliffhangers and never before seen tactics, everything anyone has ever wanted to see in a fight happens in this fight, and Sukuna even gets more powerful afterwards, leading to two questions. How could Kashimo possibly follow that up, and how could he even begin to do anything like Gojo or Sukuna? Jujutsu Kaisen has teased this fight since chapter 3. Kashimo's best feats were being above Hikari and feeling engaged after witnessing Gojo and Sukuna's fight. That was all anyone had to say about him. No solid ground to stand on, only hope on a tightrope. And a lot of fans knew this. For Kashimo, it was never a matter of if, but when and how long. Especially after Sukuna's newly developed space cutting attacks, victory was never in the cards for Kashimo. So just like Yuki, he fell flat on his face before his run in the story even truly started. His curse technique stipulation of killing him upon completion in conjunction with his desire to use it only against Sukuna serves as a one-two punch for his character. Kashimo is placed in a losing position story-wise and is vaguely above Hikari's level of power, which shouldn't compare Gojo who clears Hikari 10 times out of 10. Sukuna's amp in his own curse technique's downside, the final nail in his coffin would be Sukuna's character. He represents a being that has departed any limitation placed upon him, human, cursed spirit, or otherwise. He exists to be on a different level of power than anyone else in Jujutsu Kaisen. As I did with Yuki, I want to give a better way to use his character that makes sense to me which comes with two changes and one constant. Do not hold back his technique for Sukuna at all, don't make it one use, and play him as another strong man to be defeated. Kashimo can still want to fight Sukuna, but it won't be the center of his character. Rather, he just wants to fight strong opponents and will be more willing to use his curse technique against Akari. This would also make sense of his two chapter death against Sukuna because we as an audience got to see everything about him before he was killed off. Kashimo dying as easily as he did should have been expected. Sukuna has been this world's strongest for so long, eclipsing anyone who felt isolated by their own power. He shows them that he is this world's ceiling, and Kashimo has no other choice but to look up at him. Whether he'd waited 10 or 1000 years, closing a power gap that vast may have just been impossible for him. Yuki Tsukumo getting slaughtered should have been expected. Kenjaku's desire for human evolution spanned lifetimes and centuries. Yuki remained undecided until she finally found her answer to Chase. But she was just grasping at a spark flickering in the darkness with zero experience in pursuing it.
Yuki and Kashimo were two characters I personally expected a lot from. Yuki was the first modern day special grade, so having her killed in the only six chapters we get to see her fight in is just sad. Kashimo getting 47 chapters of build up only to hit a brick wall is even more disheartening. This leads me to think that by building them up and giving them impressive powers we hardly get to see fully explored, leaves both in an everlasting state of wasted potential.